Okay, so a very warm good morning to one and all present on the platform. Today, uh, because we have been running a series of guest lectures specifically uh, for agriculture engineering student, taking into consideration their role and their prospective responsibilities in, in the world market as per the technological interventions that are coming in the present age. So today, in continuation with that lecture, this is the fourth lecture in the series, uh, yet on a very relevant topic, a very relevant theme, sensing and automation in agriculture. Yesterday, when we were there on the platform, we talked about uh, the AI and robotics, right? So the main uh, core behind a week, what we call in AI and robotics is the role of sensors. So today I expect that the expert which we have pulled for you under the IDP and AGP Pantnagar, uh, Dr. C.B. Singh, who is Applied Research Chair at Lethbridge College, Canada, will obviously be giving you very uh, useful insights that will help you to generate a perspective, a background of how actually when we talk of automation, the basic thing which act behind it is sensor. It how, how exactly it works, what are the functionalities that are involved, how you as an engineer can find out your role in deciding your prospective area of research. So I welcome you, sir, on the platform on behalf of GP Pant University. And initiating the session, I first of all invite Dr. UC Lohani, sir, who is project scientist at uh, the IDP NHP project here at Mantanagar for the welcome address and introduction of the speaker. So Lohani, sir, please. Okay, thank you, Deepti. Uh, so a very good morning to all the participants and good evening to our today's speaker, Dr. Chandra Singh. Uh, if I like to start with the introduction that I feel proud to say that he is my BTEC batchmate. So this is, I, I feel very proud. Uh, so that is the good, uh, I think, starting line to start with. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we were planning for very long back to interact. Uh, uh, means one time he came here in the university also, and again we are planning to meet in the university. But just due to COVID situation, we couldn't make it. But anyhow, we just uh, make a plan to interact online with the students. But uh, I think as the COVID situation will be settled down, then we can have interaction, offline interaction with the students, with Dr. C B. Uh, so, I'd like to introduce Dr. C.B. Uh, just by uh, going through his uh, brief biography. So, Dr. Chandra Singh is Applied Research Chair in Agriculture Engineering and Technology at the Lathbridge College in Alberta, Canada. He conducts research on post-harvest storage and handling of grains, including in-bin drying, aeration, mathematical modeling, sensing, automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and non-destructive quality evaluation of agri-food products using NIR hyperspectral imaging. Prior to joining Lethbridge College, he was Associate Professor of Stored Grain Facilities at the University of South Australia. Earlier, he worked as a Principal Engineer Grain Management with OPI Systems Incorporation, a Canada-based world-leading advanced grain management technology company. Dr. Singh obtained his PhD in Biosystem Engineering from the University of Manitoba, Canada. He completed his Master in Post-Harvest Engineering from IIT Kharagpur and B.Tech, of course, as I told you earlier, in Agriculture Engineering from G.B. Pan University of Agriculture and Technology, Pannagar. So, I again welcome Dr. Singh and uh, I hope the topic that he have chose, uh, chosen today, the sensing autonomous in agriculture and basically in the storage and grain and other things, so hopefully our students today, the participants will take this advantage to uh, grab the good things from here and advanced things from here and try to apply in the research. So again, I welcome Dr. Singh and again, I welcome all the participants and uh, hopefully we will go with a fruitful session from now. Thank you, Deepti. Well, uh, thank you, sir, for such a nice introduction. Well, we are pr privileged to have such alumni with us, uh, like Chandra Singh, sir. So, uh, without wasting a minute further, I now invite uh, sir to please take over the session. Hey, 
Thanks, Umesh and Difti, for the introduction. And it's always a great pleasure to you know, to come back to the Pantnagar Associate. We always feel proud of being a Pantnagar, you know, or as an alumni of the uh, such great institution. So today's my topic uh, and is very general. And uh, I, I'm also egg engineer from Pantnagar, uh, a background in egg engineering. What we learned in agriculture engineering at that time, maybe things have changed now, but it's very different. I never thought of when I was an engineering student that how this technology would be in the future and how we can apply. So my example is very broad. I just thought of bringing in the concept in general to you, but it's very generalized to give you that idea that uh, yes, what things particularly in North America are happening. So uh, some of the things may not be so relevant, but the concept can be applied. Okay. So are you able to hear me? Uh, uh, are you yes, able to you hear? Yes, 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 see me. Oh, OK, OK. So let's start with it. And then once I finish this, and then if there are any question here, uh, I'll be happy to answer that. Okay. So today's topic is sensing and automation in agriculture. And this is a uh, brief overview of my talk today. I'll talk about food security. Obviously, why do we want to do this and why it is important? And the big reason is food security. Then I'll talk about different sensors and control systems uh, that will include then satellites, aerial imagery, variable rate technology and its application irrigation monitoring and control, and then autonomous robotic farming system. And then I'll summarize this presentation. So starting with the food security, uh, what population is expected to reach 9.8 billion by 2050 from the current 7.6 billion, which means that 50% increase of food production will be required. By that means that in order to increase the production, then we we'll have high pressure on natural resources, and also sustainability of the food system. In addition to the challenges, severity of the weather due to the weather due to the climate change further threatens food security and sustainability of the food system all over the world. So we have plenty of challenges uh, in front of us as a researchers, you know, engineers to deal with. And the worst challenge is, or the biggest challenge I would say is in farming, nothing waits for you. And this is a wording from a, a very advanced smart farmer in here, Canada, and I was chatting with him, and this was his wording, and that stuck to my mind. Yes, you know, if, if you want to wait 10 days, if there is no rain, you can't wait, you know, or your crop will dry, or if you miss 10 good warm days, then maybe the weather is not friendly to have the up, uh, your best uh, output from your field. So that's that's another challenge. But in today's world, as I mentioned, we have uh, plenty of opportunities. D digital technology we see every day, smartphone, smart TV, laptop, everything we have seen that the advancement in last 10 years particularly. And agriculture is also one area where this is, there are plenty of opportunities, there are several developments that have already taken place in this area, I, I will highlight later. So in distant technology is throughout the each cropping cycle, farmers have to make several management resource allocation decisions. And this year, this I'm talking about here, the farmers, particularly in North America, they are average somewhere 3,000 acres to 5,000 or 10,000 acres each farm. So they have to make some uh, management decision and they cannot guess it. So that, that's why this technology is very beneficial. To, Digital technology combined with analytics and automation can enable farmers make timely and informed decisions on accurate information for their uh, crop production, and which will increase their uh, crop production with optimized inputs, means fertilizer, seeds, uh, pesticides, uh, water, uh, water, all these inputs they can uh, optimize with this uh, using the new developments in digital technology. Uh, precision farming has the potential to increase crop yield by 70% by 2050. So we require only 50% increase. So this has gives us opportunity to actually meet the global de demand and deal with the food security that uh, is the biggest challenge uh, ahead of us. And also this creates a $250 billion farm tech market. So this is huge in terms of the, the, the 
value that it creates this whole technology. So I'll start with uh, uh, industry four. If you would have seen the, the earlier industrial revolutions, so industrial revolution one that came in 1780s, 84 around, and that the first at that time, what it is that it uh, started mechanization is for into the industry, steam power generation, weaving loom. Then we move on to industry two, and that was in 18 around 1870. What is this that it created a mass production line, assembly lines, electric energy use. So that was the second revolution. Then we had third uh, uh, revolution, industry revolution 3.0, and that actually started a lot more with automation, computers, and electronic develop devices development. And that was in 1969, around that time. Now we are in, uh, talking about are there, it's uh, happening now, it's called Industry 4.0. So what in this Industry 4.0 does that, it's now cy cyber physical production system across the manufacturing industries would lead to the smart production. So this is what is happening now uh, in the Industry 4. And agriculture is part of it. So it's not just the manufacturing, but it gives the opportunity for agriculture industry as well to uh, use this uh, new development into uh, increase the crop production system. So what it does that basically intelligent products, machines, networks, as you can see here in this order, uh, systems independently communicate and cooperate with each other over the entire manufacturing process with minimal human intervention. So this is all about automation now that we are talking and it is smart manufacturing or smart production with this new development into technology. In terms of the precision control or precision agriculture, that's the talking point you know, into agriculture. What it does is that basically it's a smart control system that's making smart decision without any human interference. And the, it has inputs from the sensors uh, IoT, different IoT devices, then communication, uh, data analytics, uh, cloud storage, cloud computing, data visualization, that all combine to make this control, a smart control or precision control. These three things are the core of it. So you have the sensors and then uh, analytics, you analyze the data and then develop the control system. Obviously, the other, you know, as uh, mentioned, are part of it. What is a sensor? Perceive uh, physiological entity or environment. It's not something new. This is the one of the, uh, I say the most precise example of the senses. Our eye, human eye, or uh, as uh, an example of the senses. What it does is, it is a sensor with almost 120 million, million pixels. Constant motion at around 70 to 100 hertz. So our eye is always constant motion, it's scanning whatever is around us. And then our it's communicating with our brain. Is brain is constantly integrating the output from the eye, and then we are making decision whether we, our uh, uh, any gesture, body movement, or other things. So this is the best example that we have as example of the sensor. In terms of digital sensor, cameras, all the cell phones have the, all the cameras. So we have digital camera. Uh, it has a sensor into it, and then it works on the different parameters, resolution, field of view, working distance, depth of the field, all these configurations. So within that parameter, that uh, make different application of the digital sensor or digital camera. So. You can have them on your satellites, those cameras. They are scanning our, our surface and then sending that information back and forth. Or you can have it in a tabletop. So this is from one NIR hyperspectral camera in my lab that you can see that uh, uh, it's scanning the elements in NIR region, and then we can actually map the composition of those elements after scanning them. So this is one application. 
this is another example of smart grain management system and that's my work is heavily involved. If you not have seen the grain bin or grain silo, I'm not sure how many of you have seen, but this is the typical uh, storage here, end bin grain storage that uh, is uh, used to store bulk grain here. So it's a vertical steel car. Uh, uh, there are some in India now. It's uh, now becoming more and more uh, common for the bulky storage, but vertical steel structure that has uh, up to, you can store up to 12,500 tons of grain. But typically I would say around 1,000 to 1,200 ton storage in one grain. The best thing is that it, you can apply lots of sensing technology. There are permanent structures into it. As you can see here, this is the, from the top, there are some uh, cables. You can see the blue uh, cables suspended from the top. One is called moisture temperature. The other one is just temperature. So they have basically different temperature and humidity sensor. They convert into the moisture. The other type of sensor is that here, the heavy space temperature sensor. That means that in that area where in uh, you can measure humidity and temperature of the air in the head space. Also, it has electronic insect device that can actually uh, count the number of insects if there are any insects into the grain. Uh, on the left side, you see there's a weather station that can actually track uh, uh, your local weather condition, temperature, and humidity. On the right side, you see that this is connected with a fan at the bottom. So what fan does that it pushes the air through it and at air moves up up through the grain bulk, you can use it to either uh, cool the grain or dry or both. So using the fan and heater, other you can measure the pressure when the fan is running. So what my work in wall is a lot of developing these control system algorithms, how the fan will run, how, and that will be based on the sensor. So we know what is the grain temperature, for example, these blue cables, grain moisture, we have the local weather station, we know what are the outside condition, whether the air is dry enough, it's cool enough to cool the grain, and that becomes actually closed loop control system for the fan. So it makes it more efficient. Temperature and moisture, they track like human body. If when we feel bad or something, we're not comfortable here, or we are sick here, or we have fever, our body temperature goes up. Same thing with the grain or other biological entities. When there is any spoilers, there is insect activity, molds, then the grain temperature will increase and that we can track through it and uh, then we can either dry it, cool it or move the grain from these grain bins. So that's one of my major areas that I work at the moment. So this is another my site in South Australia where I was. So this this is, a, these are the actually uh, thousand ton silo each. So each of these have a grain of thousand ton we have wheat or barley and they are uh, the they are usually steel but here in this case they are painted white because south australia where the site is located is actually very hot so to minimize the effect of uh, solar radiation they painted obviously it's a costly and if you see the pole it has a weather station but this where the local weather station it's all cloud based wireless system so uh, I should have mentioned in that. So all these sensor data, you don't have to go actually to that side. It's all connected to the now the cloud or wireless system. So for example, I'm sitting here in Canada. I can almost log in uh, every day and see the grain condition. What's happening in that bin in Australia or India or any part of the world, as long as you have uh, some sort of communication through internet. So how this technology work here, you can see here the weather station and fan node. Uh, it has also uh, the control system for the fan. So uh, it's all connected to the, uh, at, at the top, you see it has the cable node. So cable node connects the data from the bin, the temperature moisture, it sends to the your gateway. Uh, gateway is connect, has a cellular model. Gateway connects your data to the cloud. So all the data is in the cloud. You can see using your cell phone or your tablet or PC. You make a change that you want to run the fan or the conditions are good. 
you turn the fan on using your phone, the gateway will tell to the fan node and the fan node will check into the weather, whether the weather is good or not, and then it will communicate back to the aeration fan. So you are sitting in your lab in Pantnagar. If you have this log, uh, access to the site software or the login, you can turn the fan on sitting where you are right now to any fan in Greenbin all over the world and monitor. So this is the beauty of this new technology with our wireless sensing system, uh, uh, cloud based uh, control systems. This is an example, real time example. So for example, the, the uh, remotely you can view, you can just log in if you have the login credit in sales and this shows you the temperature. So if you look at the right side, that was in November 20, 20th, 2018. So when you loaded the grain bin and these are different sensors and you see visualized in 3D and that information is tabulated into the, excuse me, table form. So what you do here is that you can see the temperature. What was the temperature of the grain? Obviously you want cooler temperature. Cooler is better too. Like you have, if all of us have the freeze. Why we have freeze? Because if we can lower the temperature of the food commodities, right, you know, then we can store it longer. Same thing with the grain. If we can cool it down, then we can store it for longer. No mold or very less mold, no insect or minimal insect activity. So grain is safe. So second time that you can check here every day. So this is example, January 30th, 2019. And then you can see here that all the grain has been cooled using the fan, as you can see in the uh, 3D silo view, to uh, below 20 degrees Celsius, which is good. The one difference in Australia, though, you would be thinking that why so hot in November? Actually, it's the different in uh, uh, climate conditions. So January, December is the hottest in Australia. Uh, I have been there, I lived there many years. Uh, December, pretty much January, you can see the temperature, 40, 45 degrees Celsius, I've seen there. The winter starts in April, but they they have to cool it down to lower temperature during the summer month, and that can be only done if you have the automated control system, where decision is based uh, fan decision is based on the actual weather condition. So during daytime it's hot, no fan run time. As soon as the outside is cooler than the grain, the system will automatically kick start the fan to push the air through the grain and cool it down. So some of the other applications of the sensitive technology in field agriculture, or, or I wanted to cover today briefly, is the satellite imagery data, that aerial imagery data that will be used, variable rate technolo technology, precision irrigation, and autonomous robotic system. So start with the satellite aerial imagery. Satellite imagery data with very high spectral resolution and uh, spatial and temporal resolution is now available. Uh, if these are different satellites, Landsat, it can give you the data within 30 meter spatial resolution. Sustain, uh, Sentinel-10 and all the way up to rapid eye 5 meter and then uh, planet scope 2 is 3.1 meter. So you can get your the information from your land or field at 3 meter resolution, so 3 by 3, you can see that's what this satellite can see and tell what's happening in that plot. And most likely within a 3 meter plot here, again I said these are the form, use the forms here, there are 3,000 3, square, uh, 3,000 acres to all the way up to five to even more than 10,000 acres. So in that if you get some information within 3, that's pretty close that you can detect any weed, any problem, anything that's going on in that field. It's the, in India, we have the small form, so this could be challenging still, but here it's pretty good to apply these. And drones, UAV, and light aircraft mounted sensors are also used to scan crops at very high spectral resolution. So other than the, the satellites, these are drones that they can map smaller fields, you know, and then you can get the information to apply into precision agriculture. So hyperspectral data, what hyperspectral does actually, and we are all familiar with the color system or the color camera, all our phones have color camera. So color camera has three bands basically, RGB, 
and three uh, bands, the, or you can say three different senses, maybe they combine information. So the picture that we see in our phone or any digital color camera is a combination of three color bands, R, G, B. In NIR hyperspectral imaging system, you can get in NIR that's not visible to human eye, but you can get hundred of wavelengths at different, uh, hundred of images at each wavelength by varying those wavelengths. So for example, here, you can start one wavelength at 1000 nanometer, 1010, 1020, all the way up to 60. And you get 2D image, but at one image, if you look at across all the wavelengths, this is how you plot the spectra. And you can see the change or the variation in your analysis. So this is very powerful tool in analyzing any compositional changes that happen at one particular pixel level. One example of this is an IR hyperspectral imaging in the field is called NDVI. So NDVI, normal, normalized difference vegetation index, what it does that in IR light, there's a lot more, if you can see this image here on the healthy leaf, if you look at the NIR band, there's a lot more refle reflection of NIR light in the healthy crop. Okay? If you have a stressed leaf or a stressed crop, due to the maybe not enough flow of nutrition or due to stress due to the water, drought or heat, then your NIR light absorption will be low. So even if you are using your UAV drones or satellite data with NIR sensor in it, if you map your field based on NIR camera or NIR hyperspectral imaging system, it can map out and see where is the problem. You cannot do using with RGB because RGB, red, green, blue values are almost same in uh, dead leaves, stress leaf, and healthy. So this information is very, index is very useful in mapping your plot and then making some uh, precision at decision. So this is, uh, this shows some of the examples that what they do with this uh, uh, different uh, uh, smart agriculture application of this imaging technology. So first one is that you can use the plant counts, counting and yield pred prediction, plant health, as I mentioned, with the, using the index that they have, advanced plant health indices also, uh, plant height measurement, you can see the re reflection, how much reflection you are getting, and then you can tell that what, how, how grow, much growth your plant has, whether it's a, the way you are expecting it has enough, or it's less, and what are the reasons and how you can improve. Canopy cover mapping is one example. Many applications in this. Some of them is scouts reporting, so you don't have to go and check your field. It can do stockpile measurement, nitrogen content in the weed, for example, in here. And these are different wavelengths. So it's a visible sensor, visible five band sensor. I don't know what those bands are, but you can use different. Uh, sensing system, different wavelength range, and you can get different type of information from your field. Some more example. Also, this information is a lot. There's a huge uh, database. It's called Google Earth Engine. So what it does, it's a platform for scientific analysis and visualization of geospatial data sets, horse satellite images from land sediments. So, it already has the images from these for different location, you know, over the cloud. So you can analyze the forest, water coverage, land use, uh, as is uh, other type of the uh, uh, information from this. And also the interesting thing is that Google Cloud platform is the uh, integrated with this Earth Engine with the machine learning. So you can actually uh, develop model, train your model at very high speed with this resource. Next, I mentioned is the variable rate technology, or it's commonly referred as VRT. And this is a leading development or currently used in precision agri agriculture. So it reduces intake of fertilizers, chemicals, and increases the yield. So, for example, if you don't have any information variable, so if you most of the our uh, fertilizer implements here you know, or seed up, they will apply fertilizers at the constant rate. But our land requires uh, nutrition composition of the land may not be uniform. We don't need the same amount of fertilizer or 
all the field. Maybe need some component higher, one component, and then uh, in other uh, location, we need some different kind of nutrition element. So this actually varies the rate based on the requirement, and I'll show the, how it does. So map based BRT uses a pre-generated map of the landscape and input it into the precision system. So we can do these maps and we know what is the problem. Where is the problem, for example, here? Edit uniform or different areas. And then actually we can feed it to the VRT system to make a decision based on the field conditions. Or we have actually the sensors that install on the implement the the for example in the tractor or the vehicle that's a carrying this equipment. So for example, a sensor is in front of the tractor and then it's scanning the field and telling this uh, the machine how to use the rate of fertilizer or pesticide or any other chemicals. Okay. And these are the some technology that use N sensor, Isaiah, Greek Seeker, these are the uh, leading VRT technologies used for this application. And what it does that application of herbicide, lime, other chemicals in seeding and detection of weeds and disease crops. This is very common uh, currently used here. So this is a NDVI uh, uh, normalized different vegetation index that I talk about. So I'm not sure with these. So this is a map for your feed and you can get it uh, uh, from different sources. And this map, you feed it to your uh, machine, VRT machine, and based on, as you can see, a different colors, and they what they mean, you know, based on the, where is the requirement, you know. There maybe there's some area where there's no crop. It's already dead, for example. If the index is very, uh, very different in some areas, if it is dead already, then why you apply fertilizer in that area? Because they already dried or very high elevation, or in some area, if it's wet, you know, you don't need. So it actually creates a map, a smart map. It makes decision based on what the your uh, field map you provided and how you can optimize using the variable rate to make sure that you get the crop where you can get and it knows the parts where it knows that it cannot improve it and certain area where it knows it can improve more, apply more fertilizer. This is another, another example of uh, variable rate technology. Uh, Previous one was using the field map, but this one you can see at the front of this tractor is actually a sensing systems. So that's actually uh, measuring the nitrogen application, the how, how much nitrogen is required based on the sensors and the crop, you know, growth or the color of the crop. And then this sensor is actually telling this in the back is the fertilizer application system. And it's telling based on this information how much fertilizer has to be applied. So it the, it makes the it, the application more efficient. If you think of three thousand acre farm, there's a lot of saving. So here we talk one side we talk about the crop where you use the yield map and then optimize. The other side we have sensor that's actually measuring and. What you can do is actually it combines both. So you have the field map that has been generated over past 10 years uh, in which area you had more crop, which area had no crop. You know? So it combines actually the previous your know how, how you have been farming, you are using your own field uh, yield map from your tractor combines. So all the combines now here, they give the yield map. So you pretty much know in one square meter how much grain you got it. And over 10 year PA, you can create those maps. And then you have a sensor that in the and combine both, and then actually it optimize the application. As I said, that it knows that okay, this area has the potential to increase the yield. We need more fertilizer, or and also based on the measurement. But if it knows certain areas are higher elevation and there won't be any crop in that area, it will totally ignore it. Another application of VRT is in smart spraying. So Bosch is working on this. Uh, technology actually to using they are using actually using cameras as you can see here in their sprayer and ai artificial is, uh, intelligence to in the smart spraying technology to identify weeds and spray herbicides only where needed so what it does that actually identifies if you it scans your crop 
and it can detect the weed and not just the weed, but what type of weed is required. And each weed may need a different herbicide. So it's not the common herbicide that you are just spraying uh, your whole field, but it's actually detecting by the camera ahead of the sprayer, the smart sprayer, and making a decision. Okay, once it detects what type of weed is it, and then it directs that particular sprayer here, smart sprayer, to only deliver that herbicide or combination of or the common one is required. So there are many challenges here. It looks good here on theory. You can see that your tractor is moving regularly at a uh, certain speed, you know, because you have to cover many more acres per day. So the camera has to detect it, make a decision, and then communicate to the sprayer to apply that particular herbicide at that location, target location. So if you move 10 inch, probably a 20 inch more, a bit, a bit a earlier you spray then it's not use efficient. So it has to be target detection and target application. And what they claim that they can do it actually within 300 milliseconds. That's quite interesting to you. So everything from the image taking and AI making a decision, telling a sprayer to apply that is particular herbicide and then it's sprayed on that particular target weed and not just one weed. That continues continuous basis as the more field is scanned. So how does it work? Again, I'm talking about uh, control system, but the, all the control system rely on certain sensors, so flow meter. So for example, here one tank in this side, other tank on the other side, they have different flow meter valves, control meter valves, you know, they're mixed together, and then these are different room spares that they apply different rates or based on the requirement or when the command tells them to apply. This is another example of this uh, system that developed by Rev and other control uh, system development company for this application. Third one is the precision irrigation. So precision word is the efficient use of well, whether it's a fuel, fertilizer, water, seed, any input that you know, smart to efficient use. So same way as I mentioned, the traditional automatic system in irrigation on a user defined fixed schedule using the timer. So normally here irrigation uh, uh, typical system is that they have a knob. They tell that okay, start now and run the irrigation system for 10 hours or four hour per day. So certain days maybe it's raining. If your irrigation system is based on the timer only, even if it's raining, flooded, it's still going to run for that time. If that's what you told it to do, and it's not looking outside that timer for any. So it's a not efficient. It's waste of water, and maybe if your crop is has excessive water, it will impact crop growth and the yield. So smart irrigation is based on the plant water need. So if the again, it's a, the, all these closed loops, loop system are based on your need. So it could be anything. In this case, for example, you have the sensors in the field that they measure actually the soil moisture every day. And then based on that, they make a decision when to irrigate or the run, turn the uh, pump on. Not just the soil, but also looking at the current weather data. So they know that if it's raining, that, or it's going to rain or it started, so why should if the so sensor will not know probably where the water is coming from the rain or from the your irrigation system. So it it also checks with the weather station and then your um, requirement and that's how the system runs. Weather based sensors also refer as uh, evapor uh, evapotranspiration e ET sensors call also used so they have much more advanced information about the plants need for the water and they are used and as part of control system soil based sensor i mentioned detect the plant water stress by matching soil moisture and these are the some of the controllers that developed uh, this is a soil sensor for example it shows here that you know that uh, your it's again wireless sensor that uh, measures the soil moisture and then it sends to your irrigation control system 
and based on the your uh, how hot or cool the day is, what will be your plant water requirement, it turns that irrigation system on. And this is provided with example, for example, pharmacists is you can search up for more information. Uh, that's so one of the largest com uh, precision agriculture company companies in North America. So this is actually one of the best uh, smart irrigation system platform that's developed by Motorola. It's called ADNet. So it this you can integrate everything in this single platform. For example, different walls, water flow meter, weather sensor data, your fertilizer. Uh, you can also have the water pumps different and then all combined and then it can track and monitor everything in your farm. The last part is autonomous system. So uh, this is, uh, I took this from the case, uh, uh, the, the, the company, and they define it, how it's the one system is, aut autonomous system can have different forms. So the basic is guidance. So guidance is still, it's a helpful. So for example, use the GPS. So most of the tractors here have GPS into them. And I don't know if you know or not, most of the tractors here are autoist here. So in India, we have a small farms and we have cheap labor. And also, our check tractors are very cheap, relatively. And it's difficult to actually develop any guidance system for such a small plot. So we still have man, uh, driver is sitting and manually is staying and while is uh, doing some job in the field. Here, it's most of the, I think I would say, more than 90% tractors, they are auto steer. So there is still a person sitting here, and you can see the guidance on that one side. So there is still a person sitting in his air conditioned cabin, but he is just the feeding. I showed you the map. So they just feed the map, tell the information, and then it's guiding, it's auto steering based on the GPS information. But that is still efficient because you are not repeating the rows and you do your job and make it more efficient. The next stage is the coordination and optimization. Still, there are two implements, for example, one is the combine and one is the other one is, say, for example, it's a combine, it's a harvesting, but it's also coordinating with other uh, machine into the farm. So this is the truck that will take the grain from uh, combine when the combine is full, and then it will actually take it to the grain bin or somewhere where they store it. So there's a coordination between them so that he knows when, when or they're moving along together. So actually it's, they have the same path, same direction, and then moving together so that uh, it's real time is loading the grain from combine into this one. The third one is, uh, operator assisted autonomous system so where they are fully autonomous but they are also there's a backup so there's a it's doing or the one job on its own but there is a person sitting in here supervise that's next uh, not yet a practical it's still mostly it's just the the trial stage or limited application but actually there's one person in the form and he is controlling all these machines in the form who are operating in, aut uh, in autonomous mode without a driver. Footy, full or autonomy is that no person is required to operate it. And that's where the future is looking. So the farmer could be sitting in his house or he could be in vacation in anywhere else. Or maybe there's uh, somebody who is in India who uh, has providing this service to thousands of farmers in five or ten years down the road, that's where technology is going to be. So it's like a call center. India has lots of call centers, and you call here to your phone or TV or a bank. The call ends up in Chandigarh or in Delhi. Same thing will happen with these farms. So the farmers will uh, or the hire a service provider in India who will operate all their farms sitting there and monitoring and watching. And the farmer doesn't have to do any work at that time. This is case fully autonomous tractor. So 
they it's not yet commercialized. There are many issues that people where they are off road. What will happen if they are on the road? You no, know, or so there are many questions un answered. But this is how the tractor look like. Of the, this is the future tractor. Another development that's again a Canadian company, a robotic system. The dot technology you should explore more. This is another fully autonomous vehicle that can. So you can see here this U shaped the vehicle and it uh, has 197 horsepower diesel operated engine here. With what it does that, you know, in form you have different implements. So for example, when you are seeding, you have a seeder. You are using uh, uh, spray, uh, applying some herbicide, chemicals, fertilizers. Then you have uh, sprayers. Then you are harvesting. Then you have a combine. What it does that actually, you can fit it to any machine, or oh, oh, not any, but many of these implements, and it mixes them, and that it moves as a tractor. So basically, this is another tractor of the future, and they are doing now the the field trials with uh, several for, uh, big farms in Canada and US. So this is another future tractor. No driver, nothing. It's also uh, very precise. I think it can go up to in a, uh, six to within six inches. So if one row with GPS fed information, next will be within six inch resolution. So very good. You don't need if there is anything, any obstacle. It has a, I don't know, lighter or some sensor. If say for example, it's in a farm and there is a tree. Whatever. If there is a wild animal, deer or anything, any animal in front of it, will it crash? No, it will stop. What happens if it? Uh, because the field is not uniform. What if somewhere mud is stuck there? It will send command to the operator. Whether it's, is the operator is in Delhi or in the same form or into the same region, wherever it is. So this is very interesting development. You can see here that actually it moves and locks with the seed seed master. That's another seed uh, seeding equipment company out of Canada. So now you feed your GPS or the map and then tell it, and it will. Seed, you don't have to be in there. It will automatically seed your total form. And when the job is done, it will just send you a text that it's done. If there is any seed, there's no seed, there's no fuel, or the, you know, ran out of fuel or seed, it will send you that I need fuel to move on, or I need more seed to finish the job. Same thing. It, this is the sprayer boom you can see here. That's spraying some pesticide or chemical or liquid fertilizer. So same that pl platform the robot. Now it's combined with this. You feed the map of the plot and tell it what to do. It will automatically do it for you. So the challenge, there are many challenges with these implements, and the one issue is compatibility issue. Each form will have many equipment here uh, you know, uh, from impl uh, implements from different manufacturers. So maybe uh, here is the tractor from one company, harvester from another company, uh, seeder from another company, uh, irrigation system from another company. How do all these devices communicate with each other? Mm -hmm. How we integrate them? How we make sure there is a standard? They all are talking to each other. Communication, if you recall my one of the slides, uh, uh, precision control, the communication is very important. You know? How how it, the cloud uh, it's communicating with the cloud storage or cloud computing. So it is must that there should be comp uh, must uh, com uh, comparability among all agriculture technology platforms, equipment implements, you know, which is challenging. So one uh, foot has been on this side is the called ISO bus ISO 1783 standard has been developed. It's in international protocol for electronic communication between implements, tractors, and computers. Uh, interoperability of data transfer being the services, actuator, control units, cloud servers, and display. So all they communicate and they are compatible with each other. Single console can control several implements. 
for uh, different application from cellular manufacture. So this is one that uh, standard. If you look into that, their list, you, you want to buy something as a farmer or as a technology developer, uh, you should go into this ISOBUS standard database and see whether your that uh, sensor, uh, farm equipment, implement, you know, control system, is it compatible or not with early devices? So that's another good development. So this is my summary, very generalized summary. Uh, emerging digital technologies can play a major role in developing sustainable crop production system and ensuring global food security, increase crop yield, monitor crop health, optimize fertilizer application and nutrition uptake. She highlighted that uh, precision planting, efficient spraying and reduce use of chemicals, efficient irrigation management and control system. So while this all is good, the farmer's adoptability is the key for the success. Right? So these are the different potency in the application, but when you think you think whether uh, given uh, the application, what you can use in terms of technology, what Indian farmers can adopt from all of this at the cost, because some of them, a tractor here, normal, I'm telling you, a tractor here is, average is 450 horsepower tractor. In India, average will be around 35, 40 horsepower. So here the cost is, tractor costs from half million to 700, 800, thousand dollar. In India, I don't know how much the cost, but much less. If you convert the even half million dollar, that's about 2.5 crores for one tractor. So while you have to be innovative, you have to look, uh, look for the application, uh, the cost effective solution that the growers or the end user can adopt from this new development. So that's another challenge. Thank you. I don't know if you are familiar with this animal, uh, animal or not, uh, but this is one Australian animal, and I was visiting a zoo with my kids actually, so we took this picture in Australia. Here is my email address. Uh, I'm happy to answer any question now, but in future, if anybody needs to reach me out, uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir, uh, for the very insightful session indeed. Uh, the presentation, the way you deliberated was very a uh, structured one. And the way you initiated uh, with giving the simplest example of sensor that specifically shows how, how much you are involved in teaching, how much you think from the perspective of learning. That was very nice about this presentation, sir. And uh, looking into the overall perspective, after putting your point of view to the thing, after putting your research inputs, you ultimately gave the take home messages also. What are the constraints? What are the opportunities? And what are the things that are supposed to be considered while we are thinking of using a sensor based technology and integrating it to, into the agriculture system? Take it in terms of monitoring the crop health, taken in terms of diagnosing various diseases, various pest infestation. So indeed, the session will obviously help our agricultural graduates and will hope that uh, your insights will be pooled for developing the human resource, specifically of agriculture engineers of our university. Well, and now uh, it's time for the question answer. So if the participants who have joined the session have any specific query related to the uh, related to the session or related to the university which sir belong, belongs to Ledbridge College. So you are most invited to put your questions on the conversation box uh, and otherwise also you can put your uh, microphone at off mode and ask your question personally. So if there are any questions, you are invited to put your questions to the expert, please. Thanks, Deepi.
Yeah, say so if anyone has a question, they have to first uh, unmute, then only we can hear. I think, CB, I have to start with one question. Okay. <laughs> Maybe other uh, will join after later. Okay, uh, actually, CB, uh, if you see a trend in scenario, uh, yeah. because uh, we got the news that during COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, almost 1,500, more than 1,500 tons of grain, food grain, you can say, has been wasted uh, under the FCI go-downs. Yeah. So my uh, question is that, uh, because FCI under the government, and uh, we know that the what the features, what the facilities, what the technology are available all over the world. So, what are the constraints to the, our Indian government that we cannot uh, go up to the technology to save our food grain because 1,500 tons uh, too much? So, uh, what do you think in that prospect? Uh, it's just uh, I don't know. It's a more uh, at the policy level decision. It's not this technology is not in India. Government initially had uh, talk about this uh, bringing into the, uh, the, the private industry, public private partnership. And one example is uh, uh, when I was working for the company early in Calgary, in Madhya Pradesh, government signed a contract with Adani in the, for the about uh, 500,000 ton storage. So, they have this technology, this uh, the example that I gave all this monitoring system and compared to the cost that, for example, the, the waste is here. If you consider the 1500 ton storage, the cost of this will recover in few years. And this is uh, durable. So once you have a grain bin, it's something you can use it for 30, 35 years. Mm, exactly. Okay, thank you, CB. Uh, sir, can you have, uh, can you just briefly give an idea of exactly how much uh, the technological cost will be added if we go to automation thing? It means uh, in terms of cost benefit means, is there any consideration or is there anything? Because obviously when you are working on this technology, you might be hoping for commercializing this technology as well. So uh, means what cost is added or how much um, means obviously when the cost is added uh, or it, it has added advantages also. So in terms of the uh, cost benefit analysis, how much the sensor technology will help? So in terms of the cost, if you see that uh, you're storing, say, for example, 1500, uh, 1500 tons of wheat. You know? So how much is the cost of the one ton of wheat? How much is about? Mm -hmm. So around, I would say 250, uh, I'm still thinking dollar, I'm not sure about. But uh, if you consider, the, even I give you, let me give the number in the dollars. So even if it is two, uh, it's uh, uh, 200 ton, per, usually the wheat is about 250, 260 uh, in that Canadian dollar. You know? mm -hmm. So if you add it up to 200 ton minimum, I'm saying, okay, for that 15 and that becomes 300,000. So that the 1500 ton silo cost will, the silo construction, all the monitoring technology, everything will be less than the grain you are storing. So over 30 years of period, if you by just put investing this into the, your technology, you know, you can be sure that you will not have a single crop, most likely that will go, will go on bad. It's just what 30th, uh, you can divide that, you know, how much benefit it's giving you over the whole period and how much risk actually you are mitigating from that. Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for the answer. Uh, we have uh, uh, Kushwa, sir, has raised his hand. So, Kushwa, sir, uh, you are invited to ask. Him. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh... Congratulations, Dr. Sivi Singh sir. You have good information and you have a good work there. And uh, just uh, my nice uh, query, uh, one query that uh, when we can feel that we can work, uh, cultivate from home, like uh, in COVID situation, everybody yeah. working from home. Can we cultivate yeah. from home? And when it it will be true, and it will be, uh, it will be it, it deemed can be true. Yeah. So not yet. We can do it now. But I, I think in 10 years, we will be able, hopefully we, yeah. the COVID is yeah. gone much earlier. We don't have yeah. to, but this is where it's heading. 
in 10 years you will be able to do mostly uh, cultivate some home we can do yes. cultivate some home. yes thank you i think i have also uh, uh, made our the student another myself dr hl kuswa i am principal scientist in iri pusa new delhi i have also helped nai of the pannagar i have done my mtech from pannagar so i am very proud uh, that uh, you are there also okay so that is my also dream that uh, within uh, 2040 we can complete ten, we can ten, work, uh, within we can 10 within uh, we ten can yeah uh, uh, this the, the one example i gave excuse me that dot technology you can search is yeah. that you know it's very close to so the they have done tested most of it here, you know, and I work with some people closely. I know them. It's now the regulatory requirement that you know, ethical requirement for the how they play on that side, you know, safety side. Here they have to go through all the review process. That's where it is now. So, I think European Union, uh, sorry, yeah, European Union working on the hand free hectare and this type of project they have and hand free farm nowadays. So that may be uh, leading to in future that would be cultivate some home. Yeah, so a smart farm is a new concept here, you know, that now. Okay. So there are many actually the, as part of our call is uh, next Monday we have a meeting to discuss about how we can make our farm a smart farm just okay. coming Monday. So not just that we are going to automate, but what is part of it? So it the all the sensing technology, weather station, uh, this, uh, you know, yeah, uh, uh, drone or uh, your soil sensors, uh, grain bin monitoring, everything is part of it. How you can automate, you know? And then I you. still, and my work is mainly with the companies as applied research here. So I am not developing a basic sensor. You don't have to do companies are doing yeah. how you can develop a new application. And that's what agriculture engineering is about. You know? So bringing in some application and I see huge potential in 10 years and agriculture engineering is uh, one area that is going to remain and will be in demand in next 10, 20 years. But we have to update ourselves. We have to learn things. We have to know how we can use AI, how we can use uh, this uh, new the sensing technology. So we have to be smart, but the future is very, very bright for the, this, uh, this particular area. OK, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. You have good Thanks. work and you have good information. Also. Thank, thank you. you. So moving towards the conclusion of the session, uh, sir, I request you to stop presenting your slides. Thank you. And requesting all the participants as well uh, to put their videos on. So moving towards the end of the session, it was indeed very insightful session and sir, because uh, the final exams are going on. So uh, we were expecting much of the strength, but students somehow were not able to make it out to uh, be present on this, obviously due to examination pressure. But uh, we are hoping that in future days when we will seek for more collaborations with you, obviously more students will be joining and will be getting deriving out benefit for their respective fields from your presentation, from your insights. So moving towards the end, I request UC Lohani, sir, for the formal vote of thanks, please. Okay, thank you, Deepthi. So now coming to the end of the session, uh, uh, very, very thankful to Dr. CB uh, for a wonderful talk. And uh, as he said that the role of agriculture engineer or engineering is the application part. So still we are far away from that. Still we are doing basic research. So that is the good learning for the students that the research we are doing, if we do uh, with the point of view that we have to apply in the field. So obviously we are going to ahead with that uh, uh, technology, commercialization and all the things. So uh, very good talk by Dr. CB. So very, very thank you, Dr. CB, for giving this uh, knowledgeable talk and giving your valuable time to us and uh, share your knowledge to our undergrad students and uh, some PG students are also there. So hopefully uh, with your talk that the students will learn much better and will do research much better in, uh, in the front line. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants uh, because uh, as uh, DT already told that the uh, final examination are going on in our university, so most of the students are not able to join because of that. Uh, but still some students are there, so we are thankful to them. Uh, hopefully you have learned uh, some good ideas, some good concepts from this talk. Uh, 
so last uh, but not the least, uh, thank you to Ms. Deepthi for wonderful arrangement of this talk and good conduction of this talk. And uh, 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 she has put uh, everything means just background, uh, you can say uh, the background role of means preparation of poster, preparation of link and everything. So uh, he has a, she has a very good or important role for the conduction of this kind of talk, online talk. So with this, uh, one more time, I thankful to Dr. CB, thankful to all the participants, and thank yeah, you. And people. thank you everyone for attending my talk today. And yeah, I was surprised. I one of uh, my friend, he is an IT Raul Kela, and your poster he shared with me. So yeah, definitely he, he he got that information. Um, your communication team. Yep, and uh, hopefully CB, I think in future uh, we will uh, have the interaction session offline, face to face. So yes, certainly. I, I was there a couple of years ago when I was in Australia, I think. Yeah. But I'll yep. be very happy whenever I come and I definitely I like to do that. So. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir.